Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is... Amazing! Thousands of copies have been sold across the United States and the world. You can pick up your copy today on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Did you hear me say business, education, your business? Hint, hint on our guest today, who's going to talk about a little bit about business and economics, if you will. Very fun things to talk about. I have a guest co-host with me, another of our president guest co-hosts that um, we were able to profile in our book, Commencement, the Beginning of a New Era in Higher Education, which, of course, you can pick up on Amazon. Selfish plug, um, uh, but, you know, you got to put it in there. We put a lot of work into that book. Um, and she's guest co-hosting with me, and I'm going to bring her in right now. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen. She's Dr. Joyce Jacobson. She's a professor of economics at Wesleyan University and Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and she was the former president of Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and the applause went out before I could get it out. Joyce, welcome back. It was a little too much there, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. You do a lot. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, doing well, keeping busy. I bet you are. Um, how are things? You're in upstate New York currently somewhere? Upstate How's, New how York, yeah. It is actually nice weather here for, uh, you know, cross fingers. It stays that way. You know, I always have to ask because I was born and raised in Syracuse, New York, right around uh, that area where you are. I'm just an hour from there. It's it's a great, just flew into that airport last a couple of days ago. Well, we're glad to have you back on the podcast on the other side of the microphone, interviewing one of our guests. Um, I will ha I will say there's been a lot going on in higher education these days. We've seen some pre-court uh a challenge and denials on certain issues like uh, a race-based admissions and student loan forgiveness. We're seeing, um, I would say, public perception of higher education. This has been happening for a long time on the decline. Um, and, you know, whenever somebody writes a, a article about confidence in higher education on the decline, and that article goes up and people comment like crazy all over that article on LinkedIn and repost it and repost it. And we talk about how bad higher education is, and then you wonder why the public thinks it's bad because we're all reposting bad articles. And I go, man, what a great time to be an innovator within higher education. I mean, if you can innovate within higher ed and you can make it happen, this is a great time to be in higher ed because the consumer's telling us we have to innovate. So if we do, we're gonna regain the trust. And I think we've got somebody with us that's gonna tell us all about what's going on in and around higher ed and public perception and policy. I'm gonna bring her in right now. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is. Her name is Dr. Darlene Opfer and she's the VP and Director of Education and Labor at RAND Corporation. Darlene, how are you? Good, how are you? Oh my gosh, I do a lot of talking, don't I? I'm gonna be quiet <laughs> now. Be quiet now, we're, we're, we're so honored to have you here. Um, I think if you haven't heard of RAND Corporation before, um, maybe you know it, you're not listening, it's a big, big worldwide corporation, but let's assume we have somebody here that hasn't heard of RAND Corporation. Can you give us a little bit of uh, information about RAND Corporation? What does RAND Corporation do? How do you do it? And what's your role there? Yeah, so RAND Corporation is a research organization, nonprofit, nonpartisan. Uh, we are 75 years old this year. Uh, we historically take on uh, really challenging problems that a lot of people don't want to take on. Um, and use data and analysis to uh, understand those problems and help improve decision making and policy. Amazing. So talk about your role a little bit at RAND and what you do and what your focus is. Sure. So I lead one of the research divisions. There are seven research divisions at RAND. Uh, they cover four on the defense side and three on the social and economic policy side. I lead education and labor. Uh, my division, I sort of uh, characterize as having the human capital pipeline. So mm -hmm. I, we start with pre-K and we uh, do anything related to education, workforce, post-secondary ed, labor issues until people retire. Um, I have about 200 researchers who work uh, in my division, and we have about 100 different research projects going on at any one time. Can you list them for me? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> that's a crazy large see. number. Yeah, that's a large <laughs> number of research projects that are going on. Let, let's let's um, let me ask one quick question, and then I'm going to pass it over to Joyce. Education and labor. Um, so we're 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 
in higher education in particular, we're having conversations around the lack of, of connection between our education and what the workforce is demanding or what, the, what they're seeking. And this conversation is really fascinating when you think about where we are in the world, because six months ago, eight months ago, we're having this conversation outside of AI, and all of a sudden we're having this conversation inside of AI, how we educate people, are they relevant for the workforce? Where's the disconnect between what we're teaching and what companies need? Can you give us a, what's, what's the environment like right now? Or do we, what's being said around education and workforce and its connections? Yeah. Um, so, so first of all, let me say that uh, six years ago, I only had education and we made a conscious effort to reorganize, to put education and labor together because of the issues you're raising about um, a perceived disconnect between education and what our labor markets and businesses and workforce needs were um, so that we could better align and answer those questions about um, making those transitions. And what I would say is that um, we still have a long way to go. Uh, there's a, there is a, still remains a big disconnect in lots of different areas between what the labor market needs are and what the education system is producing. Why is I that? Really, I was what, really struck, Darlene, by your idea of coherence and the need for coherence in education. And I think it's part of this relationship of how the labor market needs and what we train people to do or educate them don't match up. I wonder if you could talk to that since this is a podcast on higher ed in particular about your views about the coherence in higher ed. Is the educational structure in higher education coherent? Because I know you've done a lot on K through 12 and issues with coherence there, but I'd be interested to hear specifically about higher ed. Sure. So, so we sort of start with a, a hypothesis um, that most education, whether it's at the K-12 level or the higher ed level, is incoherent. Um, and by that we mean like it there that the parts of education don't actually relate to one another. So you think about courses, uh, assessments, um, uh, enrollment kinds of criteria, the training that is done for either teachers or professors, that those things um, aren't aligned well. Uh, they kind of just happen randomly. Uh, they're right. all in their own sort of silo, if you will. And right. so because of that, we think that um, what ends up happening in terms of student is they get a really incoherent education. Like Nailed it doesn't it. match up. They get a little bit of some stuff over here and a little bit of some stuff over there, but it doesn't lead to anything that um, is really structured and aligned. And the more aligned systems that we see, we think the better outcomes are for students and particularly students who are low income um, or for from underserved populations. Hmm. So we're so we're starting from a place of we're incoherent. I mean, think about what that what that means. Um, so student, it's funny, because I was talking about this the other day, a student doesn't understand all of the parts of higher education. When you think about other industries, you think about other things that we buy, you don't have to understand what it does. It just happens for you, right? We think about like, um, so one, of my, one of my colleagues gave an example of Uber. Like when you, you, if you look at Uber as an industry, it'd be really weird if you're trying to anticipate the needs of your consumer and just an Uber pulled up on the side of the road and just asked you if you were ready for a ride, that'd be really <laughs> creepy, right? Yeah. So they're anticipating your needs that when you call one and you're ready for one, whether you have one person or five person or 20 bags or two bags, it's there for you when you're ready for it. Higher education isn't always designed that way, but that's the way we as consumers are starting to understand everything that we're, it's just there when we need it. And if we have to navigate structures we get really tired of doing that pretty fast. Don't you think, Darlene? Um, yeah, I mean, I think right now there isn't a lot of structure. Um, and as a result, it sort of just happens to students. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, and if you think about a coherent system, then it, it gives a, a very um, clear message uh, about this is related to this and this is why you're doing this now. Um, and then why you might do this next. Um, 
that happens in a structured coherent system. Right now, uh, you know, we have a lot of students who are just sort of floundering through a system Floating. and yeah, exactly. Without any real pathway or structure and telling them like, this is where you need to go do you think and how you need to get there. Ed, Joyce, I'll pass to you in a second, but do you think that's why higher ed is taking the hits it is right now in terms of low uh, public confidence and why we're seeing more, um, I don't know, more, more uh, talk around skills-based training? Because it's easy to understand. Like if I go for X and I come out with Y, I get that. Um, where, you know, if you go into the higher ed system and you're floating and we don't have that level of, of pathway described, it's easy to lose confidence in something like that, right? Is that is that why we're seeing some of the confidence and public perception in higher ed decline? Well, I think it's for two reasons. I mean, one is the, the floating nature of it um, leads to a lot of students not completing. So we have really high incomplete rates um, that combined with the, you can still get a degree that doesn't lead you to a good job. I think those two, you know, those two things combined sort of set people up for like, okay, so what's the point of getting a college degree if it's not going to get you a good job and you may not finish it just because it's not clear how to finish it. It's funny to think of education that way. And I mean, I'm totally, I get it. It's like education is there to help us to a better life. And better life has been increasingly translated as better financial life, not necessarily um, more enlightened. And I think a lot of what goes on in college is this challenge between also depth and breadth. Like right now mm -hmm. at Hobart and Wynn Smith, we're rethinking our general ed curriculum. And so one issue is, are our students getting the breadth they need in college as well as the depth? Do you think that one of the problems is that we are just trying to do too much in higher ed? I mean, many other college systems in other countries really just focus on the depth. You go in, you do a major, you come out three years later in some cases. Well, we're doing a four-year program or sometimes infinite length for people who never finished, which tries to do both. What do you see as the trade-offs in trying to be generally educated versus career educated? Yeah, so so I completely, I, I spent um, the most of my career actually in, in higher ed institutions. RAND is the first non-higher ed uh, organization that I've worked for. Um, and so I, I totally understand the sort of argument that people need to be sort of educated generally. Um, so I understand that, but I think it uh, needs to be a both and uh, in the sense that yes, we want people to be generally educated but they also need to be educated so that they end up with um, good outcomes. Nailed it. Those tend to be economic. But, and I think too often thus far, we've sort of uh, erred on the side of generally educated. It's hard to, you know, I've talked about this on this podcast, that the whole concept of general education is very hard to understand too, because what is valuable these days what is valuable tomorrow or yesterday it changes and i think higher ed has we have a big marketing and packaging problem right if you think about general education it should be such that you could go to a parent or you can go to an adult student and say this general education wherever you try to call it even if you just took this it would yield you this and and you'd be able to take whatever outcome there is and do something with it. And you think about the way we even name courses. I've, people probably are just going to turn this podcast episode off, not because of you, Darlene, or Joyce, but because they are hearing me soapbox. But, you know, you, uh, philosophy or, you know, math 101. It's like, what if it was, you know, using AI for math programs? Or if it, you know, you think about what we would call a class to make people understand its value could immediately change consumer confidence, I feel like. Yeah, I agree. But I also want to uh, push back on it. You, you said the sort of things, what, what needs to come out of higher ed changes all the time. And I actually would push back on that a little bit and say, I actually think that there are some fundamental things um, like learning how to collaborate, critical sure. thinking. You know, there, there are a set of skills which actually could uh, very easily be taught in a general ed course, but it does go to your rethinking it. So like, instead of like philosophy 101, 
you're going to use philosophy to learn how to to think critically. I don't know what we'd name that course, but that like the outcome should be critical thinking, not just do we know who Plato is and you know. Yeah, yeah I so agree it's with you. True That's... general ed in that sense, because it's I think part of it is trying to think of it as a capability building approach, potentially. I think that's what maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth, Darlene, but the idea is that any course that's general, it has to develop these capabilities that are useful across across various dimensions. Absolutely. And if that were if that were the case, if like every general ed class had an outcome that was one of these sort of standard skill, you know, or capabilities, if you will, then I think people could see the value of them. That's a fact. That's a fact. We, 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 that's where the packaging comes in. You know, as I argue that, that higher ed has lots of value, but we have allowed it to fray. We don't package it right. It still exists. It's not like we have to reprove why getting a degree helps some someone pretty you know and i always think when it comes to value who how many people do value their degree that don't say much about it we do hear from the people that don't maybe value their degree or somebody that didn't complete college because you know um they have a lot to say but the person who's working and, and is in their field and had a degree from a school maybe they're not as vocal it's the whole consumer thing where you get nine negative comments for every one positive so I wonder if we're just not not seeking out those stories as readily as, as we could. What do you hear from from the workforce partnerships and the research you're doing out there? You know, are is there value in work for uh, in the uh, companies looking for degrees still? Because you hear, you know, this company dropped a degree requirement. That one did. What's the reality of the situation? Um, I see sort of two things happening. I mean. On the one hand, I see um, businesses still wanting those skills like collaboration, critical thinking, being able to write, um, those sort of, uh, if you will, generic capabilities. Um, so I see some businesses saying, hey, just give us those people. If they can do that, then we can teach them the sort of specific skills we need in our areas. And then I'm seeing other areas where it is, no, we need specific skills. And, and those I, I see as sort of like healthcare would be, you know, uh, IT, um, manufacturing and engineering. Um, there are certain uh, areas, certain businesses that really want specific skills and not just the generic. You know, one thing was that the community college system was supposed to be part of this bridge uh, not only to be, get people into into four year colleges, but also to actually build more skills. But what was really striking over the last few years is how much community colleges have stagnated. I mean, I was always so proud of them as an American that we had this whole system, um, but now they seem to be very unpopular. Students don't seem to think that they're bringing value. Um, we know the transfer rates aren't high. What do you see for the future of how community colleges could help in this bridging? Yeah, I, so I do see uh, the problem you're talking about, sort of the generic community college degree not being useful or not thinking that it's useful. And then I see other pockets where there are community colleges which are really leading the way. Um, so for example, we've had a long relationship with um, the state of Ohio and their community college system um, because they went to stackable credentials. So, you know, their entire community college system, um, regardless of which community college you go to, um, has gone to the stackable credentials uh, pathways in different areas, including healthcare, IT, uh, um, and engineering. Um, and it creates very clear structures for people. And so I see sort of Ohio community colleges having a resurgence. Um, they are taking in a lot more students. They're taking them into these pathways. Uh, there's a clear connection to industry um, for those pathways. So they're seeing very good labor market outcomes um, for them. So I think that there are pockets around the country where community colleges have um, really seen the writing on the wall and are trying to, to meet the demand. And then there are others where it's just kind of this sort of old-fashioned generic oh yeah 
Join the movement to mobilize and revolutionize higher education by picking up your copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education today. This book has been featured in Forbes, NPR, Harvard Business Review, CEO World Magazine, NBC News, CBS News, and Business Insider, among many others. Don't miss out on what today's highest college leaders have to say about the future of higher education. Pick up your copy on Amazon. What about, give us the worldview a little bit, Darlene. You've, if I understand it, you've uh, helped and uh, consulted or worked with uh, uh, Israel. Um, you've done some work in India. You've been everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting because education has, if you start to look at education and its trends in the U.S., we understand it, but when you go outside the U.S., it's almost the opposite in some places where India is a good example, where they're just really pushing higher education in its specialties. Give us a worldview a little bit of what you're seeing out there in terms of higher ed, its value, what trends? Yeah, um, I, I sort of see a bifurcation, which is not unlike the bifurcation we have kind of in the U.S. And, and by that, I mean, so you see places like India, um, Israel, uh, Germany, where you see these sort of very clear pathways around skill development leading to specific degrees that are tied to the labor market. That's like a clear sort of um, one set of where higher ed is going. And then you see another set, which is kind of elite institutions. So even in places like India, you see this bifurcation because the majority are trying to get people into good jobs but they're also um, investing heavily in certain universities to sort of move them up the world rankings. You see, I've, it, that's been happening in every country. I mean, even in the Middle East, they're in, you know, they pick one or two of their state run institutions and they put go all in on research and uh, you know, publishing in order to move up those rankings. So you, you the the sort of higher ed world worldwide is kind of moving in two different directions. I guess Good then advice. I'm concerned about, you know, does it become an agency for increasing um, the divergence that we're already experiencing in this country and, and in others in terms of outcomes so that you get tracked fairly early and then um, you end up in the high, high earning sector with the good jobs or the you know more stagnant sector where you might have a job, but it's not the growth path. So how do we avoid that as we develop our system? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that there is a, actually a danger of that happening. Like it, it um, increasing the sort of inequality of outcomes that we already have, it could make it worse. Um, I think it's gonna be incumbent. So in these stackable credential kind of situations, um, I know from Ohio and Indiana and Colorado, that you can stack up to an undergrad degree. I think that's really important. Like we can't just stack to an AA or an AS. Um, so there has to be a pathway beyond, um, there has to be a continuing pathway. Yes. Um, it, it can't just stop at an AA or, or even frankly at a BA or a BS. Like there has to be, um, there has to be somewhere for people to go if we sort of think about lifelong learning. If we don't create that, then we are creating these sort of two-tracked systems where we have certain people that are only getting skills for certain jobs. And then we have other people who are being sort of generically educated for sort of elitist opportunities. I wonder if that, what you talked about, like in India or the Middle East, is, is the you take some of these state run organizations and you invest heavily in them to bring them up the world rankings that creates um, a brand of exclusion to, to some degree, or eventually it will. We've done the same thing here in the United States. There are certain uh, colleges that I, you know, I, I, I always am fascinated when a school, a college puts out a press release saying, that they have had so many applicants and only accepted a, a portion of them and that that's a celebratory moment. And you're like, what if you were selling jeans? Would you be like, hey, we had 20,000 people interested in a pair of jeans, but we only sold 1,000 pairs. <laughs> and there's, 
19,000 geneless people out there, right? So you think about, so only in higher ed do you celebrate those moments, but it creates that diversion that you're talking about. Are you, are we almost seeing that happen in other countries where they're on their way to create like a caste system of universities in yeah. the minds of the consumer? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and it's most, uh, I think one of the clearest examples of this is in Qatar. Um, so in Qatar, what they did, they have this thing called Education City, um, and there. they, you've been there, yes, uh, it's very, very interesting, you know, and, and what they did is they lured the best degree programs from uh, worldwide institutions to come. So, you know, you have journalism degree from Columbia, uh, and you have you know, other degrees from a, a specific degree from Harvard and one from Yale. And in Qatar, then you have the sort of Qatari universities. And so the Qatari universities are educating for the labor market. And then you have these sort of elite degree programs like journalism at Columbia that are educating an upper class, if you will, within Qatar. Bullseye. Um, there's nine. Is uh, last time I checked, and oh no, there's nine U.S. Uh, or U.K. universities within education. City right. names you'd recognize: Georgetown, Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. uh, I think Columbia. I got to think yep. of the others of the Northwestern, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And it is very much. And by the way, the um, physical space of Education City is amazing. Yes. Um, and so you're walking into almost this um you know first class experience and when i went down there and to qatar and i saw it i was like wow how come students even know about this well it is it it is where you you have to be able to afford it and you have right. to be able to be there and go there and do, do things so to your point yeah i mean that is a very interesting model yep yes but it definitely is this bifurcation of you know the higher ed experience um, and they're not alone in that. I mean, we're seeing that in lots of different countries that are sort of trying to move up in the world, hmm. making those kinds of decisions. I mean, I get it from an economic point of view. I guess it's just sad to sort of think that the Amer what I would call the American experiment, which is let's try general education and upward mobility for everyone is failing but i mean it does seem like it is in the sense that it's an expensive system to run it wastes a lot of people's lives and time um it's just i hate the idea of tracking people so early i guess that's it's just disturbing but how do you yeah, yeah but i guess that's that's the trade-off that's the fundamental trade-off we have i guess darling one of my big questions is as someone who's working in a in a think tank a policy institute how do you feel that you can have the most impact of propagating these examples you're seeing. I mean, until this interview, I didn't know about Ohio, for instance. How do we get those examples out there? It seems like that's one of the roles of a think tank like yours, is how do we propagate the good examples and try to bring them to other places? And how do we move things forward when you're not actually purveying, it, purveying education yourself directly to actually yeah. run those programs? Um, so I think uh, you know, it sort of start uh, early on. And, and by that, I mean, um, like one of the things that I think has become really important to us at RAND is maintaining long-term relationships. So we've been in Ohio for eight, I think eight years. Um, they passed a law 15 years ago to start the stackable credentials. And then we, we came in sort of after that. But having that long-term relationship with Ohio means that one, we get to see it over time, but we also really understand context, which I think is important, um, why it worked or why it didn't work, those sorts of things. So I think that's really important. We have a number of those relationships. We have one with Texas that is very similar and long, long term. Um, but then secondly, um, you know, how we get the information out there. First of all, at RAND, because we work in the public interest, it's part of our charter, we publish everything. Um, so if you go to our RIDS website, which is rand.org, um, and you look for education and labor, and you look for post-secondary, uh, you will find multiple reports on the Ohio uh, work that we've done. We've probably put out five or six different ones. 
but we're also really think trying to think about how people receive information. Um, so, you know, when you do research, you, you have to document the research. So, you know, we have what's called a RAND report. They're too long, nobody reads them, but they have to, we have to do them because people need to understand the methods and why we made the decisions we made about what we collect and don't collect. Okay, so that's there. You can find the RAND reports. They're a hundred and some pages long, you know, if you really want and that I kind of detail. I can help you summarize them if you'd like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but what we're also trying to do is put out much shorter, smaller things like research briefs that are only a couple pages long that get right to the, like, what did we learn and what does it mean? Like, what does it mean for what uh, colleges and universities need to be doing? The so findings, we're trying, if you will. Yes, the findings. Um, we're trying, we're trying to do much uh, more of that. Uh, we're trying to write op-eds more. We're trying to do webinars with practitioners more often. We're not there, um, but we do understand that that is a role we need to play. Um, and are really trying to be thoughtful about doing that. Or podcasts. Yeah, I mean, or podcasts. Start, yeah. yeah, I, I just worry there's so much good information in think tanks, et cetera, but how to get it out there, how to get part of the bandwidth out there. And, you know, because a lot of the bandwidth is taken up by stuff that isn't very useful. And to know that there's all this depth of information, it's very, it's frustrating that we can't get the good stuff out. And I think it is partly our own fault for not being good at, as good at PR. And it's good that Joe and Elvin, you know, do this so that we are getting some out through podcasts. Yeah. yeah, no, it is it is a constant frustration for us. You know, how do we make sure that like what we've learned other people uh take advantage of? I mean, I will say that, you know, we're we we try to be plugged in to networks, um, like networks among states, et cetera. So um, the Ohio work, we were doing the Ohio work, uh, we gave a webinar to a group of states, and then as a result, Indiana came to us. So now we're working with Indiana. So there is that, you know, we do see that kind of sort of take up where one state sees another, what we've done in another state and then asks for help. Um, but we could be a lot better about uh, getting what we've learned out there to other people. So you can go to rand.org, go to research, and then and then it'll take you to the research areas and research divisions. You click on education and labor, and then there's, oh, look at that, Darlene's picture. And then <laughs> all of the um, studies and, and recent work that you've done. How do you decide what you're going to research? This is like, I feel like this is such a dumb question, but maybe it was a simple one. like. You're doing a hundred research studies. Does somebody come and pitch this to you, Darlene, and go, "Hey, you know what? I was talking to my buddy, and he thought we should research this." Is it, is it like grant funded, or I mean, how does it? How do you decide on those hundred research studies? Great question. Yeah, very good question. Um, so we are a soft money organization, meaning that uh, we don't have anybody funding us just to exist. So. Um, every study we do is funded by somebody. Um, and I'd like to they, also say the Edip Experience is a soft money organization. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's all about getting to the hard that. money people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so uh, it comes to us in a couple of different ways. I mean, states or other organizations will come to us and say, hey, we need a study on X or we need to understand what's happening with X, can you help us? Um, and so we then, you know, we'll put together a research plan and, you know, they say, yes, that's what we need and, and they'll fund us to do it. Um, other times we're pitching um, and we pitch in different ways. We can pitch to foundations. Um, so we'll go, we have contacts in lots of different foundations and we'll go to them and say, we see a need um, we think this is an area that people need to understand better. Will you fund us for it? Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, and we rely a lot on um, federal research grants. So National Science Foundation, Institute for Education Sciences, NIH, um, we hit them all. <laughs> um, and so that's another avenue for saying, okay, we think this study needs to be done and it's worth doing. Can we convince a group of people to fund it? So you're always working it. 
You're always working it. So it's not like an R and D budget that sits on the side for your employees to go, Hey, we think we should research this. No, no, we're always, we're always working it. So we're always responding to RFPs or we're pitching. Um, uh, we do have also donor supported um, stuff. So these are individual people who have a passion about something um, and are willing to sort of give us uh, money that is not tied to a specific study. So two examples in my division, um, we have the Lowy um, Middle Class Pathway Center. So this was funded by Peter Lowy uh, and his family and he gave us money to figure out how do we increase the number of people in the middle class and That's how do great. we keep and how do we keep them there? So not tied to a specific study, just a general area. The other one we have is the Epstein um, Veterans Policy Research Institute. So Daniel Epstein uh, gave us money to start an institute to just understand veterans issues. Hmm. We and in we cover workforce issues there. We cover health issues. We cover housing. Um, it's really broad in terms of what what we look at with that that money. Amazing. This is, yeah, this is great. Understanding the nuts and bolts of how how Rand works. I mean, I've, I've heard of it for years, and it's a complex organization. But Darlene, what what is the work that you're most proud of to date? Either that you did by yourself or co-authored, either at Rand or somewhere else. What are you the most proud of? Um, Besides being I, on the Epic Experience podcast, <laughs> that, went without, that went without saying. Yes, Joyce. Yeah, you know, I think it's not any one study; it's like a group of studies. So we have a really uh, the the center I just mentioned, the Middle Class Pathways Center. We have a real commitment among researchers at Rand uh, in terms of access. Um, and, and completion and keeping people in the middle class. So there's a whole set of studies that we've done on, and the stackable credentials kind of falls under this, uh, work that we've done where we're trying to see how do we get more people into educational situations that help their lifelong outcomes. Um, so stackable credentials kind of thing, we're doing a big push on uh, apprenticeships right now, uh, which are, you know, sort of falls under that. We've done a ton of work on um, what I call sort of wraparound. So these uh, in colleges where there's a one-stop shop where students can go and figure out like how to get food stamps, how to deal with housing stuff, how to get their taxes done. Um, in North Carolina, there's an organization called One Stop that does that. There's a Aunt Bertha, which is another sort of program like that. So really trying the work that we've done on like access and completion, I think is probably the stuff that we're most proud of. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what this, uh, th this, uh, I, I love when somebody can come on this podcast and tell us things that we don't know you know, where to go for these studies, how these studies come to be. It really brings, um, it, it brings new information into higher education that wasn't there previously. That's what this podcast is all about. And also the perspectives that you bring, Darlene, are really important when we look at the worldview and we look at what's happening in the U.S. and how we regain customer and consumer confidence. But this is your microphone today. I'm going to leave you with our last two questions, Darlene. One more, more less of a question, but what do you want to say about Rand Corp? By the way, before I ask you this question, I just want to say and give a shout out to all of the researchers out there doing this work. Because when you say research, my back starts sweating immediately. And I think about how hard that work is and how tedious and time consuming and fruitful at the end, but you have to have a really specific love of researching to do that kind of work. And um, that's not work everybody wants to do. Let's put it that way. Right? Right, for sure. So shout out to your team of researchers doing this work for us. But what else do you want to say about Rand Corporation and your division, uh, education and labor? Anything we missed, anything you want to say, it's your kind of a free microphone. And then tell us what you see for the future of higher education. Yeah, so um, so the thing I would say that is really important for people to know about Rand is that we're all about impact. Um, so in terms of like my goals as one of the leaders at Rand, sure, you know we're soft money, so we have to bring in revenue. 
But the thing that I report to our board of trustees is the impact of our research. So uh, every quarter I have to say like, did our studies make a difference? Like, did something change? Did policy change? Did programs change? Did uh, outcomes improve? Um, though that's what our board of trustees are interested in. That's what matters to us is being able to say that it made a difference. So we don't do research for research sake. Like we, we don't do a study just because we want to see, oh, it's interesting and we wanna know the answer. We're only gonna do a study if we think something could change as a result of it. Mm. And, and I think that sets us apart from lots of other people out there doing research. Um, yeah. Uh, it, and it it's really exciting. It's why people work at RAND. Um, it's why people have been at RAND for decades. Um, is because when that happens, when you do a piece of research and you know something changes, like that feeling is absolutely amazing. I bet. I bet. Well, good for you. And what do you see for the future of higher education? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm still, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the the bifurcation and whether or not that's going to um, increase uh, inequality uh, more. I'm I am concerned about that. I yeah. don't know what the sort of answer is. I do think stackable credentials uh, are that's just going to continue to grow. There's lots of questions around it though, like mobility. Because right now, a lot of these stackable credentials aren't mobile. So once you do them, you're kind of stuck in Ohio or Indiana or wherever. Um, so we got to solve that problem. And we also have to solve the problem of sort of lifelong learning that they don't just end, that there's something else they lead to. Um, given the Supreme Court, um, uh, the Supreme Court coming down against affirmative action, I think that's going to cause um, some significant ripples in terms of uh, access and what that looks like and how we keep diversity in universities. It's going to be particularly hard, I think, for the elites, um, less hard for like state, big state institutions, because uh, they have historically been more diverse anyway. Um, and then I think the other thing is, I hope that people start paying more attention to completion. Um, we know we've had a problem there for a long, long time. Uh, you know, it's not, we can, we can take in as many, you know, we can create a very diverse class, but if we can't get the diverse class to finish, uh, you know, enrollment is, is not the answer. Mm -hmm. You got to finish. The best, I always say the best marketing you could ever do for a college or university is to graduate the students that you have, get them the outcomes. Because then when you're communicating about the outcomes, that is what marketing really is, right? That's- Oh, that's absolutely. The, that's the cycle. Um, when students leave without their degree or without a credential, 40 million in the US today, that's not doing any of us in higher ed any good. No, it, it, it's not. And, you know, and then we, you know, it ties into the whole student loan thing. We've got tons of people out there with, student loans without degrees um, that are unable to pay them off. So, it, you know, it's all sort of self-reinforcing if we don't pay attention to getting people through and completed. Speaking of self-reinforcing, I had to bring on an amazing guest co-host to help me improve my podcasting skills. And she's come on today. She's amazing. She is the one and only Dr. Joyce Jacobson, pro <laughs> professor of economics Thank you. at William Smith. <laughs> uh colleges and and uh, we we are um honored to have you uh hobart william smith colleges i forgot the hobart part uh joyce and and you um uh as a former college president i uh, know a lot about this don't you and how is so first of all how do you feel about this conversation second of all how do you feel about your first co-hosting gig i loved it i hope you get i get to come back that would be you fun do. Um, it's been great. I think I told I told Elvin that I'm working on a book about the lawyerization of higher ed. So I've really Ooh. been uh, doing a deep dive from a different angle. Hope I can come back and talk about that. But, you know, really learned a lot today about what's going on at RAND and uh, really enjoyed getting to to meet you on, on virtually, Darlene. Great. Yeah, me too.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, your guest today, here she is. She's the one and only Dr. Darlene Opfer. She's VP and Director of Education and Labor at the Rand Corporation. Darlene, we hope you had a good time in the podcast today because you gave us a lot of great information. Absolutely. It was fun. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take fun all day and every day here on the podcast because we can have fun and be in higher ed too at the same time, if you can believe it. With that, you've just ed upped. Attention. Forbes called commencement the beginning of a new era in higher education, a dispensable touchpoint for what's being said in, about, and around higher education now. Don't miss the insights from 125 college and university presidents about what the future of higher education holds. Pick up your copy of commencement on Amazon today.